Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your interesting insight and thought. Okay, so we're gonna move to the next speaker. Okay, uh, we are very, uh, very um, lucky today that we have a polymer chemist here that will be addressing on the effects and impacts of the polymer itself uh, to see the toxicity of the polymer. So we have a uh, Professor Suresh Baliyavetil from uh, National University of Singapore. He is a professor at the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, uh, NUS. Uh, his uh, research interests and expertise are in the functional polymers, nanomaterials, exploring the mechanism of nano safety, toxicity, environmental impacts of microplastic and nanoplastic in the environment, and also the material for environmental applications. So I think Professor Suresh already been working with microplastic. We can see uh, his paper in Google, Google Scholars, um, Scopus and Web of Science, a lot of uh, publications uh, regarding on the cytotoxicity effects of microplastic. So Professor Suresh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me share the screen. Um, okay, can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Um, yes, you can, uh, okay, Make. let me see if I can, yeah. okay, yeah, okay, so um, today I'm going to, um, I mean, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to this uh, interesting seminar, so we heard a lot about uh, um, different aspects of uh, uh, microplastics, um, you know, so today I'm going to talk more about health impact, Right. So that may be something which many speaker, uh, speakers have not touched up on. Um, as uh, our um, chair of the session was saying that polymers are really interesting uh, materials. Um, every interesting aspect has both sides. Right. Uh, I mean, we used to say the proverb that one coin has two, sli uh, two sides. Right. So from the good side of polymer, we have lots of uh, materials made out of polymers. Right. Uh, they, in fact, uh, Polymer industry has uh, our life to some extent, right? Uh, it is everywhere. I mean, you just have to look around and you'll see many of these articles are made by polymers and they are quite cheap, they are durable, uh, lightweight materials, So, um, and they have lots of usage in our daily life. Um, and they are actually produced in large amounts. Every year they produce something like 300 million ton uh, of uh, new polymers from oil industry uh, or monomers generated from oil industry. And they come with all kinds of shapes and size and functional groups, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the bad thing about the polymer industry is that they never thought about what could happen to this material after the usage. Yeah, And that's why we are actually in this uh, stage where we are talking about all these microplastics and polymer waste, etc., because there is no circularity built up on it. Because circularity only came recently, right? Uh, the polymer started in uh, you know uh, 1820s, 1850s, um, and 19. You know, it all started 1960s, and uh, you know the industry really grew uh, very, very fast. So. The recycling is never an issue for the polymer industries. They wanted to do it, but it's it's pretty hard for them to achieve. The reason being is that the recycling actually degrade the polymer, reduce the quality, etc. Right. So there is a poor re recyclability of these materials. And then the other drawback is that when the polymers are produced in a pure form, they are not very stable. They can be degraded very fast. But then what? The industry does is that they add all kinds of stabilizers, coloring agent, plasticizers. Many additives are going to this pure polymer, right? And that improves the uh, life uh, of this polymer a lot. And those additives can also play a huge role in the uh, toxicity of this uh, um, so-called polymer we talk about. And then they do slow degradation because of all this additive being present in there. And uh, it is kind of difficult to handle at this stage. The the biggest problem comes from not just the polymer, but the accumulative nature of this material in the environment. Uh, many of the our used polymers are all ending up in the marine ocean environment or rivers and other places, right? And they actually end up staying there for a long time and that causes uh, problems and they come in all kinds of different shapes and size I mentioned earlier. And that attracts the... Um, 
uh, animals, right? So sometimes they are very innocent, uh, um, you know, they go near to it, they get trapped on it. And then you have seen a lot of videos recently, there are volunteers going around and trying to cut these ne uh, you know, nets uh, and free the animals. And there is also a lot of these birds and the fish start eating these, thinking that they are at the, uh, food products for them. Um, but unfortunately, once it go inside, uh, it cannot go out, especially the bigger particles, right? Um, so then end up, they um, starve to death. So for this talk, uh, let's dis define the microplastics as something between one microns and uh, uh, five millimeter uh, in size in that range, five, one micron to five millimeter. Nanoplastic is a new term, um, which uh, many people have been using recently. Uh, these are much more difficult to handle than a microplastics because the size is much smaller. So we could call from anywhere between one nanometer to one micro, right? Um, so those are the smaller particles and even much harder to make. So, uh, Suresh, yes, can I interrupt you for a minute? Actually, can you change yeah. into the single yeah. display settings? Because on single top, because, yeah, on top, there are three tabs you see task manager. And on, I have a multiple screen, so maybe no, no, no. You, you, you have it there uh, on yeah. top. You have option C, the display settings. Can you choose uh -huh. that one and make it uh, duplicate slide? So, just uh, click this one, this one. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so the the um, then the question is where this microplastics origins? Um, it actually can come from the degradation of the existing plastic waste in the environment through photo degradation, mechanical degradation. I think many talks in the past two days uh, touched upon that. And there is also a lot of synthetic uh, polymers be uh, used in the various commercial products, especially the cosmetic industry. But now they are banned in many countries. So uh, that's a good thing uh, happened. So these are kind of origins of uh, smaller particles of uh, uh, polymers. Yeah? And then uh, uh, how do, why do we have to worry about? Because it's slowly entering into our uh, food uh, chain. Um, so we are actually end up eating these things just like uh, uh, Gulian just mentioned earlier, uh, when uh, you know, fish is eating these uh, plastics and we are eating the fish and how much is going to our system and is that a problem? Uh, at the moment, nobody's really you know addressing that issue at, in a serious manner, in a policy uh, level yet. Uh, inhalation, there's a lot of particles in the air, uh, which we kind of ignore at the moment. Uh, the particles in the air can be many, many things. It can come from the, your clothing. It can come from the tires when the automobiles are driven on the roads, uh, the abrasion uh, um, you know, uh, between the tires and the road c creates a lot of plastic particles. And then uh, there are some uh, uh, plastics and can enter through your skin as well. So these are the three major routes where the uh, plastics can enter in, uh, into our system. So in our group, we have been trying to look at the impact of uh, this kind of uh, small polymer particle into a biological system. So we have two models. Uh, one is the um, biological you know, marine animals, we can feed them. I'll, I'll show some results later on. The other one is just using the human cells. We can't do the uh, human as a model, but uh, we can actually use the human cells, yeah? So um, the, even in that category, we have two questions uh, or two type of particles. One, we can actually directly take the particle from the nature, the uh, collected from water in the ocean or uh, from river or beaches, etc., and then use them to uh, expose it to you know living animals or cells. But one of the uh, problem we face is that there are lots of differences in sizes when we collect these particles, right? So it's hard to homogenize them. Yeah. Um, the second one is the no, not easy to track these particles because they are either transparent particles optically as well as spectroscopically, and it's pretty difficult to monitor where they go in the biological system. And then usually biological system need a smaller particle. They are easier to get into the cells or tissues and uh, you know muscles and those kind of uh, areas. Um, a small, bigger particle we collect from the environment is pretty hard. And if we 
can collect nanoparticles maybe that is something which we can look at in the future but at the moment uh, getting a nanoparticle from biological or environmental samples are really tough to um, uh, collect and purify so what we try in our lab is to use the same polymers which you, you see outside like polystyrene pmma polyvinyl chloride these are very common polymers um, end up in the environment so we make these particles by ourselves in a mostly spherical in shape and homogeneous distribution. That means all the particles have a similar size and shape. Able to control the properties uh, by doing it by ourselves, we can actually manage the uh, properties of these particles. And also possibly to incorporate a tracking nickel dye. So we can incorporate a dye inside so that we can actually see them uh, under an optical microscope or fluorescent microscope. Yeah, so that has been our uh, working workhorse in our group. Um, so we have done a lot on that area and we have uh, all these particles available at the moment. Um, and the methodology is relatively simple. And the advantage we have is that now we can actually have access from 10 nanometer to uh, something like 500 nanometer particles. Um, and they are w dispersible in water and they uh, actually stay in water. They don't actually settle or, uh, you know, float in the uh, at the top. So these are kind of tricks we can do uh, synthetically for these uh, uh, particles for the current studies, which I'm going to discuss with you. So they, once you expose the, these particles to the biological tissues and they tend to go in, right? And then we can actually see where they go, how they um, uh, interfere with our uh, biological system. So the, some of the polymers particle we currently work on uh, is listed here, poly, uh, methyl methacrylate, polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, polypropylene and polyethylene is kind of new. We are still optimizing it. And then the dye, optical dye, we usually use a perylene dye. Yeah. And that's how the polymer particle looks like in the, under the optical microscope. So you can see that. And these are not the actual size of the, I did not put the scale bar because they are not the actual size. They are the halo of the emission uh, coming from this particle. They are pretty tiny. Um, uh, an optical microscope cannot see the uh, this particle by itself. Only under the fluorescent microscope, we can see those things, right? If you look at under a um, scanning electron microscope, we can see those things, right? Uh, pretty clearly, but they are not fluorescent. They are black and white uh, kind of images, right? So, uh, and also we can't use SEM in a biological system because biological system are you know, water rich and that cause a lot of problem for the electron microscope. So uh, on one side, we can actually characterize them fully by using all range of techniques. The other side, they are fluorescent, so we can actually put them directly into the tissue uh, cells or um, you know feed the animals and see how, where they go. Yeah, so let's, uh, let me show you a few uh, glimpses because I don't think I have a lot of time to go through it. For the cellular model, we take, uh, uh, make sure that these polymer particles are not toxic, uh, you know, that means we, we don't put too much and also we don't use very toxic uh, uh, chemicals uh, to start with, right? And they should be uh, able to, the biological cells should be able to take these things in a reasonable time, right? Three hours to a couple of days, not too long to expose. And uh, we must get reproducible results. So many studies reports in the literature are kind of uh, difficult to follow because some of the data is not very uh, clear enough, right? Um, low bleed through the photo bleaching. Your dye should be able to uh, stay uh, during the imaging process. It should not get shut off, right? Or it should not uh, lose the properties. So here is a bunch of uh, uh, photograph. Um, so once you have, uh, you know, you can actually stay in different areas the green uh, uh, light, uh, green uh, color is actually from a particle which we introduce so you see the green colors are actually around the nucleus they don't enter the nucleus that uh, well because nucleus is usually protected much better than the um, cell the other parts of the cell so you the nucleus is kind of um, uh, uh, there's no green particles or green fluorescence coming from the nucleus, but around it, you can see they tend to accumulate. And you can actually go probe uh, much more deeper into this thing. We have done uh, quite a bit of it. I'll show you, uh, and then uh, the uh, we can also see how much, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, is this toxic or not toxic? And we go from zero to 200 ppm. 200 ppm is uh, already a quite concentrated right so then you start seeing the toxicity in a lower concentration we don't see much of a toxicity for at least the polymethyl methacrylate 
Um, so, and then the, obviously uh, people will ask when you put the cells uh, and then add your particles, do they actually enter? How do you actually know whether the particles are inside? So we have this uh, undercone focal microscope. We can actually do a cross-sectional analysis of the images, right? So we take the image and then do uh, different sections. Yeah. So under different layers, you can still see the particles. And that is actually tells that uh, if there are no particles inside the cell, we would not see uh, such uh, uh, optical images. Yeah. So that gives us an idea uh, how, you know, the, what we are showing is actually the particle inside the cell. Uh, so these are some of the uh, things we want to do with uh, this thing, and we have been doing it, and we published uh, quite a few. So with a human uh, um, lung fibroblast cell, IMR90, we could actually show that uh, ATP production actually decreases in presence of these uh, um, uh, particles. ATP is our energy package, right? Uh, so if a cell want to do something, you have to have the ATP availability, which will degrade release energy from ADP, etc. There's a process. So if, if ATP concentration goes down, that means uh, the cell is kind of interfering with the mitochondrial functions. Then the ROS is a reactive oxygen species, which uh, usually cause problems for the cell health. Yeah, LDH is a membrane. Um, yeah. Uh, indicate a membrane stability. So if your LDH amount goes up, you actually see the membranes are actually breaking up, right? So et cetera, et cetera. So we can, we have a bunch of indicators uh, uh, to say that how healthy the cell is, right? We, uh, usually the cell doesn't need to die, right? Now we don't actually look at the death of the cell as a, a toxicity, but we also look at the metabolic activities of the cell, right? And then see how these particles in impact and they, we have done a lot of different cells i have only showed you one but this, you can think of this uh, in any other cells cell line as well with the different particles but what we i also want to show you is that what we do on a in vivo kind of studies where we use the uh, marine animals yeah where we i mean we have a few models at the moment i, I i'm going to show you a barnacle uh, is a kind of a muscle which is stuck onto everywhere in the in the ocean environment right the the uh, ship you can see barnacles stuck on rocks you can see barnacles uh, uh, get stuck so they live in a colony etc so we use the that species to look at this and then the, also we have done a little bit on adult tube worms um, tube worms are also kind of a, a worms which can feed these kind of particles and see um, our primary interest here is to see whether uh, when the adults are fed with this particle, do they actually get transferred to the next generation, right? Uh, that was the uh, question we wanted to address from this study. It's just coming up in, uh, in uh, ACS um, sustainable camp. Um, adults are exposed to uh, polymer particles for a few days, and then we uh, clean them up. Uh, so that uh, we know that they are actually saturated with the particles inside their body. And then uh, uh, eggs are collected from them and uh, um, in a clean environment, right? We don't expose the eggs to the um, particles. So then we start analyzing the eggs. Uh, in the case of barnacles, we don't see any any particle inside the eggs uh, collected from these adults as opposed to particles, right? So, but in the case of tube worm, they are, they are full of them, right? So I'll show you some examples. So here is the tube worm eggs. Uh, again, we are doing the cross section. So you can see a different cross section, different level of illumination. Illumination that means the the particle concentrations are different at different parts of uh, X, yeah? So these uh, uh, lighted spots are actually individual particles, individual polymer particles. And then one another uh, interesting things, what we just found out is that when these X are actually, you know, developing uh, from uh, day one to, you know, uh, day five or day 10, um, they tend to have this uh, ability to release these particles uh, from the X. So that is a kind of interesting uh, observation we find in our studies. We still don't know the exact mechanism, how it goes out, but you can see at, after a few days, uh, after a few uh, growth stage, you can see that there is no more uh, uh, fluorescent particles. So this is the beginning of it, and this is after a few stages of growth, right? Uh, so once it grows up, then we don't see any more uh, particle in the larvae uh, as well. But um, we can also monitor that by optically, uh, because these polymer particles are uh, 
uh, fluorescent active. So we can see uh, at different stage with the PMMA uh, inside the egg gives you a very intense fluorescence, but um, uh, control eggs have no fluorescence. And then we um, look at the animals which comes out and then they don't have any more fluorescence, right? So uh, the they have a mechanism to eject these particles because it doesn't fit with their uh, tissues anyway or cells, right? Uh, this is external particles. So uh, barnacles have a, this life cycle, which takes uh, something like five days. Uh, again, we go through that. Um, the adult barnacles are pretty uh, robust, so we can't work uh, too much of it. But the larvae is very transparent. So we can actually feed this napoli or larvae with our particles and then monitor um, up to the juvenile stage. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if the if you feed the adults, they do not transfer the uh, particle into the to the larvae. Right. Um, the uh, the tissue around the larvae has the particles, but the larvae is still protected inside it. So there are. I mean, I, the message I want to convey here is that different species have a different way of protecting with the uh, you know external pollutants. So sometimes. So they may, this may be a you know evolutionary strategy, but we are just exploring different animals to see how they respond. But the napoli has no way of uh, you know it, it needs to eat right to survive. So when they when we expose the particles to napoli, uh, I'm sorry these images are too small, but they tend to eat up. And you can see uh, these bright spots uh, indicate the particles in their uh, gut. Yeah, so they can take it up and then uh, they tend to uh, disperse all over their body with the uh, time goes by. Yeah, particle. So you can see a napoli lighted up. Uh, I think I have an image here. So you can see uh, clear, clean napoli here. And then after exposure, you can see they tend to disperse everywhere inside the inside the uh, larvae. And we can actually do a, a what you call 3D imaging of the larvae to see where the particles are, et cetera, et cetera. So these are results are published in the uh, recent paper in our. So, and it actually goes from uh, Napoli larvae to all the way to Cifrid, which is a or juvenile uh, animal where they start setting down onto a rock or uh, in a su substrate. And some of the uh, particles do get uh, ejected by uh, either through the feces or uh, by the mold. Yeah. Um, and um, and we can actually monitor this very nicely with a confocal microscope. So, so that's the advantage of our particles because they are intensely fluorescent. Yeah. Um, so uh, beyond that, uh, instead of PMMA, we also uh, compared the activities of PMMA, polystyrene and PVC using the Napoli. And you can see the PVC is extremely toxic to these uh, uh, larvae. Uh, we still uh, struggling to find out what is the cause of it. Uh, we have some hypothesis, but we are uh, looking at the mechanism at the moment. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the uh, in, I want to close it by saying that um, you know in the old uh, st strategy was this one: the oil reserves, all the mono uh, come for the polymer comes from oil reserves, uh, and industry take them and then make uh, a, a different polymers. But then uh, use plastics, they have no clue what to do with them, right? So c recently people are start thinking about how to dis redesign the whole process. Um, we may not need to use this uh, strategy anymore. We definitely have to worry about the use plastics and uh, can we get a better recycling uh, stra you know, steps or pathways or uh, somehow we can actually go from a use plastic to again, the starting point where we get the monomer and then re uh, make the plastics. And then uh, that is kind of things we are also worrying about in our group. We are trying to make the sustainable materials and then we also want to reduce the um, you know, uh, recycling or waste generation and then um, ideally uh, get to a zero waste kind of scenario. But this is uh, far, too far away. It's not so easy to uh, think and replace the existing polymers. The polymers are going to stay there for a much, much longer time. Uh, we don't have that magic material here. So uh, in this talk, I actually showed you uh, what we do with the, uh, uh, you know, the, to understand the impact of microplastics on the health of the animals as well as humans by using the mo different models and also different particles synthesized in our lab. The advantage of uh, having a synthesized particle is that we know exactly what's the shape of it, what's the size of it, what is the chemical content of that particle as well, right? If we pick up a particle from an environment, we may uh, be uh, 
thinking that this may be certain polymers or it may have certain chemical absorbed onto it, we might not know the full history of it. But if we make it in our lab, we know exactly what's the uh, compos composition or elemental composition of those particles. And since they are luminescent, we can actually monitor these particles wherever they go. Right, and then uh, they do interact with the uh, cells and uh, uh, the larvae or animals when they take a nap, and that is the most concern at the moment we have. Where uh, some of these polymers are extremely toxic to the cells, and what does it do uh, when it gets into our cells and etc. Right, uh, same goes for a barnacle larvae or uh, uh, other larvae uh, of the marine animals. And then so far we can tell us that the, once you enter particle, this kind of small tiny particle enter in our system, it actually stays there for a long time. It doesn't get digested or excreted uh, very fast. And that we have shown by the cells as well as the larvae saying, this, you know, you have seen that it actually stick with the, the tissues um, and ejection is much uh, uh, slow process. Nanoplastics are excreted by larvae uh, by molting and diffection. In some cases, we, the, some of it also get excreted by different roots. Yeah, it depends on the animals to animals. So, uh, in humans, uh, we we still think that some of it's getting absorbed into our tissues, but mo most of it probably going out uh, through our digestive system. Right? It is because we don't have any uh, enzymes to digest these kind of uh, synthetic polymers yet. Yeah. So. Uh, but depends on the size, you know, the absorption, bioabsorption can still happen. And that's what we are quite worried about at this stage. And our cellular experiment actually give us uh, some mechanism to explain those answers. So that's all I have. And I like to thank our uh, my co uh, co-workers and students who have been working on this project for some time. And we are funded by the National um, uh, Research Foundation of Singapore, a Ministry of Education of Singapore, and then uh, supported by National University of Sing uh, Singapore as well. A lot of those marine science work we do with uh, TMSI, Tropical Marine Science Institute in Singapore. We have a uh, um, island, St. John's Island. Uh, there is a uh, interesting facilities there. So we work closely with them. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address. Thank you. Very interesting sharing. Uh, we have a lot of questions here <laughs> from the <laughs> audience, uh, but I think we, we uh, I will gonna pick a few for, for you to, to address it. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, the first one I think that would be interesting to 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 have your opinion on is a uh, plastic have a very different monomers such as uh, polyesters. Yes. Constituents of monomers contains benzene, such as uh, polystyrenes, uh, PVC, mm. that contains yes. the chloride ion. So mm. the level of harmful of each type of plastic will be totally different. Uh, so what yeah. do you think about this? Yeah, um, I mean, that is why the plastic is very attractive in the man for the manufacturing industry, because of these different components, they make it different properties, offers properties. But then uh, when we talk about health impact or environment impact, these things have a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, impact as well. So, for example, if you have a polystyrene, that in fact, uh, differently than a polymethylmethacrylate or, uh, you know, polyethylene or polypropylene. On top of that, the concentration is also changes, right? Um, not all these polymers are the same amount. You have heard the many talks uh, uh, yesterday and today uh, saying that some places you see a lot more polyethylene than the other places. So at the moment, uh, you know, the data is so wide and vast and it's pretty difficult to say, uh, you know, what is in in certain area. Uh, so we have a new program uh, which we just started to look at the Southeast Asia as a whole and see what kind of polymers present in the environment in the first place, right? And then we can start analyzing it and identifying the consequence of these polymers. Otherwise, it's pretty difficult because if you think about, you know, the amount of polymer you touch every day. Uh, like you uh, drink a uh, water from po polyethylene uh, terephthalate bottle, PET bottle, right? And if you are using a, a shopping bag, it's polypropylene. So we are actually being exposed to many polymers on a daily basis. So yes, some of them are more toxic than others, but at the moment, it's pretty hard to uh, uh, you know say 
don't use this polymer or don't use the other polymer. We still have to use all of them. I don't know whether I answered that question. <laughs> yes, I, I, I do agree because in some of the industry, especially in medic medicine, I think we have used a lot of uh, plastic materials. Yes. Uh, uh, and another question, um, uh, uh, Professor Suresh, do you observe any aggregation of plastic nanoparticles the same way we observe with other nanoparticles? No, the, the way we do that is that uh, we have something called the surface charge. So these po polymer particles as a negative surface charges, right? So once you, ha you have a charged particle, then do, they tend to stay away from it because of the electrostatic repulsion, right? So that is how we make them stable in, a, in water. So they tend not to aggregate. But um, when we put them, these same particle into, a, say, a protein-rich uh, cellular medium or some other, uh, you know, high ionic strength uh, seawater and things like that, then we do start seeing some of this aggregation, right? So in general, uh, we uh, have been monitoring this, and we can actually control that aggregation to some extent. Depends on the the experimental condition which we use. Yeah. Okay. And uh, would you explain what kind of disposal method is adopted for the synthetic microplastic that you'll be using in your lab when the study is over? Okay. Uh, yeah. So in this, uh, first of all, the polymer particle we make uh, is not in kilogram scale, right? We make in uh, uh, one gram or less than one gram because many of these particles are used in uh, cellular studies in a very small concentration. So the amount we make is small and they're always in the water-based medium. They, we never make them as a powder. Um, so because of the you know safety issues, etc. So once they are in a powder, w after we use it, we can actually uh, filter you know centrifuge them or filter them with the different uh, uh, filters we have, and then we can actually separate them from the uh, solution and then uh, process it. Uh, you treat it as a solid waste, yeah, because these polymers are, uh, you know, everywhere at the moment. And then in Singapore, for example, the polymers are incinerated, right? Most of those things end up in the incineration. But in other countries, they probably end up in land waste. And then we have to a little bit worry so much about this. But um, two things uh, help us. One is the small amount. Second, uh, we do have me methods to separate this from the the used uh, waste container, right? And then we process the waste separately than uh, just dumping into the sink, etc. That is not a practice in Singapore. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think there are a few other questions. Uh, maybe the, the audience can uh, go to their uh, paper that uh, already discussed by yeah. uh, Professor Suresh because we need to move to another speaker. Okay, uh, I thank again Professor Suresh for a very interesting uh, sharing session.